This is Making a Scientist, the podcast by young scientists for young scientists, featuring cutting edge science and all of the life and work advice that you'll ever need to succeed. It's brought alive by brilliant scientists and hosted by me, Alex Hainsko. We've all felt the bass pulsing through us in a nightclub, but how can sound be leveraged as a biological research tool? Well, this week, my guest is Dr. James Armstrong, who's currently a research fellow in the Department of Materials at Imperial College London. James is an outstanding early career academic, and he's published research papers in fields such as ultrasound manipulation, tissue engineering, and 3D bioprinting. During the pandemic, James also organized highly successful virtual seminars in biomedical science, bringing together researchers in the biomedical community from across the world. He's also an incredible mentor and has been awarded the Imperial College President's Medal for Outstanding Assistant Supervisor. In this episode, we discuss how James is currently using ultrasound as a biological research tool and the potential future applications that this can have. We also discuss James' career path and all of the brilliant advice that he was either given or wishes that he would have heard much sooner in his career. Since recording this podcast, James has accepted a position at the University of Bristol, so massive congratulations to James. He's setting up his own independent research group focused on engineering complex living systems, and he's currently looking for PhD students and postdocs to join him. So if you're interested, you can find out more by visiting www.thearmstronggroup.co.uk. Without any further ado, let's begin. Dr. James Armstrong, welcome. Good morning. Thank you very much for coming onto my podcast. Uh, Thank you for having me. Yeah, of course. So um, I'm really interested to, to hear all about the research that you do because you use sound as a research tool, uh, which is, it sounds like a very sort of odd concept. Um, so you, you work on patterning cells using sound, but maybe if we start really simply with why do we even need to pattern cells at all? Okay, that's, that's I mean, that's uh, the sensible place to start, I guess. So I think maybe um, taking it back a little bit here. So uh, I... Um, I, I, I'm a tissue engineer. Um, that's that's what what I consider myself as. So this means I, I engineer, I grow tissues in the laboratory. Uh, so things like cartilage and bone and heart mm. tissue and um, muscle tissue. Uh, and the reason we do this is because we need to um, um, produce structures here which we can use to um, understand how tissues grow and how tissues might become diseased. Uh, and then to look at ways we can use drugs or different therapies to um, to, to treat different tissue diseases. Uh, and then the alternative here is it's a bit more sort of new age here. It's it's growing these tissues in the laboratory, mm. uh, and then using them as sort of clinical graphs. Uh, and there's there's a few tissue engineered projects which have uh, which have reached the market. Um, and um, if we look at tissues, what we'll find is that they're quite Um, structured and organized. The cells form lines and they form columns or um, different geometries, different radial organizations. Um, And uh, if we're going to try and recreate a tissue in the lab, we need to be able to recreate the precise um, structure of the cells. So that's my motivation here. So I mean, um, recreating the cells gives us tissues which recreate the function of the tissues better. And if we can recreate the function of the tissues better, uh, and then we can produce better graphs or better models. Oh, definitely. Yeah, I really see. I see the need. That is, um, that's a huge thing. Because I suppose then, if cells are not in their correct structures or hierarchies, then they're not going to uh, perform the same in the lab. And then you get sort of bogus results if you try and uh, like get a measurement of some sort. So, well, well exactly. I mean, I, I can give an example here. So, mm. if you think about muscle tissue. Um, muscle is made up of these long cells which are all all pointing and aligned in the same direction yeah uh, and the reason they they're like this in 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 natural muscle is it, this allows us to have this sort of directional contraction so when you contract your arm uh, your arm all moves in the same direction if that yeah. makes sense so <laughs> yeah. uh, if, if we're looking at um, taking these long these long cells called myotubes uh, and maybe putting them into a material and trying to grow up a tissue in, in the lab um, if we don't have them all pointing in the same direction, we don't get any directionality there. So that's exactly the kind of challenge which I'm trying to address. 
Oh, that's really cool. So I, um, I really can't wait to come on to this uh, a little bit later, but maybe sticking with the theme of, uh, of, of taking a step back, um, you work on acoustic patterning. So um, how, how does that work? What is acoustic patterning? Yeah, so this is, um, this is a technique I came across uh, during the, my PhD. It was towards the end of my PhD. Um, and it's a technique which people have been using in, in physics and engineering for quite a long time. Um, mm -hmm. And it's basically using um, sound waves to um, manipulate particles or manipulate matter. Um, so, I mean, if you've ever been in a, in a nightclub and you've, you know, <laughs> there's a sort of heavy bass going, you can feel the sort of the, the bass sort of um, you can. looking yeah. through you. Yeah. Um, and, and I guess that's the kind of analogy which I'd like mm. to use. Um, so yeah, go, sound go waves, for it. <laughs> yeah, well, sound waves are basically, it's all, what, what sound waves are, they're ripples of pressure. So you have high pressure and low pressure. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and in between those regions of high pressure and low pressure, you have these very sort of steep gradients. Uh, and then these gradients in pressure, they, um, they produce a, a force um, on particles or, or cells or um, mm. any number of objects uh, and this force can move the particles uh, into different regions of that, of that field so they might move it into the areas of high pressure or the low pressure or the areas of, of unchanged pressure so um, it, it's a very interesting technique and, and like I said people have been looking at this for moving particles and moving sort of uh, non-living things for, for a very long time now um, and just uh, in the last sort of five or six years, when I've really been getting into this, it's, yeah. it's been an explosion of people now looking at this as a tool for moving cells. Oh, nice. So you were an early adopter. Well, I, I, I sort of had these ideas, and then uh, there were people before me. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, for sure. Um, but um, I, I think um, it's, uh, when I first started getting into it, it was quite niche, and mm. now it's definitely moving more into the mainstream. Okay, cool. So um, with the nightclub analogy and the sound sort of like going through you, I wonder about uh, sort of internal sounds that the body makes. So do internal sounds potentially have an influence on uh, how cells are arranged? So obviously the heart is a big um, pump, right? So uh, does the, the sound sort of emanating from the heart or the sound of blood flow have an effect or is it probably, uh, maybe not, but maybe it's more the forces that they, um, that, that they produce. Um, I was just wondering, do, is there another obvious example that I'm missing about internal sounds or how they affect um, arrangement of cells or is it just, doesn't work like that? No, I mean, I mean, it's an excellent question. Um, so sound is produced by anything which, which moves. Um, mm, so mm. The, the, as you said, the heart and the, the blood flow, they're, they're probably the, the two classic examples. Uh, and they'll be producing um, sound waves, they'll be producing um, acoustic radiation forces, which um, will be uh, experienced by the cells and the tissues in our body. Um, but I, I would say that the, the, the sound waves which are being produced and the forces which are being produced, are, um, they're going to be very, very small. Mm. Yeah, uh, and they're okay. also it's not going to have the sort of um, structure that we need. So we create very structured fields. So mm. uh, we use what's called a standing wave, where mm -hmm. um, the sound wave is not actually moving. So we actually have two two uh, sort of um, sources of sound uh, op opposite each other and facing each other, uh, and this produces a, a th these ripples which are just um, sort of static and standing still in space. Um, so we use this because we want to have these, uh, this very controlled manipulation of matter. Mm. And something like a heartbeat or, um, or the, the flow of blood, you're not going to get this control. And, you, and as I said, you're probably not going to get the sort of the magnitude, the, the sort of strength uh, uh. forces required. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Fair enough. Um, so another uh, question that I was thinking about, <clears throat> when I uh, when I was doing my research for this was um, that our, our eardrums are sort of specialized to detect sounds and these sensors that you're uh, talking about are sort of I suppose like uh, well they are sensors and um, I suppose that uh, how much does the medium in which you grow cells 
uh, affect the way that sound uh, travels because you know if we were to have this conversation underwater um, you know sound travels differently underwater than it does through air so how does the the medium affect uh, affect um, the, the sound waves and how do you factor that into into your research? Well you're spot on so uh, the medium um, is is crucial um, for for the propagation of sound and the creation of these of these sort of sound fields mm. um, I mean, I think the first thing to say is that you obviously you, you need some medium. You can't do this in a vacuum. There's no yeah. sort of uh, alien in, in, in space. No one can hear you scream. That's sort of uh, concept here. Um, <laughs> as, as long as you have some form of medium, if you have uh, air or if you have liquid, yeah. uh, whether that's water or oil or uh, if you have solids, uh, different metals, they will all, um, they'll all propagate sound differently. Um, so you'll all have, you have, you'll have sound waves, but they'll be traveling at different speeds. Um, so in, uh, in, in water, I, I think it's about four or five times uh, faster than in air. Uh, mm. And then I think um, it's similar sort of um, larger increases when you go into things like metals. So um, what that means is you, if you have a set frequency of sound, um, you're just going to get different wavelengths. Um, and, and we can do the maths there, and we can calculate and account for that uh, if we have a single, uh, single medium. Yeah. Uh, where it starts to get a little bit tricky is if you have lots of different things uh, mm. in the same pot. So if you're trying to um, pattern these cells, for example, in a, um, in a sponge or in a, a sort of scaffold structure, um, where, the, where the liquid hits the solid, you're going to get reflection, you're going to get scattering, you're going to get the sound waves going in all sorts of different directions. And, and you won't be able to produce these, these static, very controlled um, fields that I, I was mm. describing earlier. Yeah. Okay, so, so um, you, you're talking about patterning, I suppose, in terms of, of cells right now, but can you also pattern molecules? And then if you can pattern molecules, does it work such that if you were to have uh, a dish where you have cells and sort of, free floating individual molecules can you have like multiple frequencies which would help you pattern uh, things differently so you could have one frequency that's sort of like big for cells and then another that's sort of like a lower frequency for these individual molecules and then you could assemble them in 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 the same uh, at the same time does it, does it work like that <laughs> yeah well i mean that would be uh, that would be fantastic that's one thing which i'm really interested in, in is okay. Uh, how you can maybe adjust these fields to to pattern different components, mm. or as you said, cells, for example, or maybe materials in in, in different arrangements, and um, have, mm. have these systems responding differently to um, different frequencies. That that would be fantastic, um, and it's a very very versatile technique. So I talk, I've been talking about cells, and I've mentioned particles. Mm. Um, people have gone upwards here, so people have um, manipulated clusters of cells. Um, oh, wow. and even, okay. even sort mm. of whole living uh, living organisms. So there's a there's a really? common model like, organism called a mm. C. elegans, which is this little sort of worm structure. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. people have have trapped these. Um, they've they've patterned sort of um, small egg structures, and uh, you can, you can go upwards very easily, um, but going downwards becomes quite tricky. Um, <laughs> so I mentioned this acoustic radiation force, which is produced. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, the thing about this is it's, it's quite gentle and it becomes more and more gentle the smaller and smaller the object. So um, if you start going down from cells are sort of, uh, you can consider them sort of 10 micrometers in size, uh, and molecules are, are thousands of times smaller than that. Um, so um, you just get this very, very, very weak force and this becomes dominated by things like Brownian motion and, and other effects, um, so you, it becomes very challenging to start to pattern pattern mm, molecules. Interesting. One way one way you can do it is um, you can package these molecules into something bigger, so like a sort of a microcarrier, and you can pattern the microcarrier. Um, so you can do it indirectly, but patterning small things is it's a big a big challenge of the field. 
Interesting. So um, two sort of follow up questions to, to that was I was thinking more about um, like, I don't I don't really see why you would need to patent the elegance. But at the same time, you could patent things like bacteria and obviously bacteria have got things in sort of industrial applications. So, yeah. so 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 I do I do see I do see that. But I was wondering sort of what's the what's the upper limit then of um, why you would uh, like of the organisms that you can use? What are the what what where can you stop? Can you patent? Em- human embryos if you wanted to or could you pattern uh yeah like, cows and sheep and yeah <laughs> like, exactly uh, well it, it all depends on the um it all depends on the wavelength here so we have to change right. the the wavelength to suit what you're trying to uh to, to pattern so um um if 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 the object you're trying to pattern if this is a um if this is a bacteria or a cell or um uh, or a worm if it's if it's much bigger than than the wavelength, then you're you're not going to get any um, any patterning for mm, it because mm. it sort of dominates uh, dominates the sound field. Um, so as long as you adjust that uh, that wavelength um, to correspond to the um, to the size of the object you're trying to pattern, um, you can go up and up and up. Mm, okay and then so i saw one of your presentations on youtube which was really cool and i was kind of wondering as well with the wh- wh- so when these cells pattern like sometimes they can pattern in the typical sort of sine or cos wave type uh of, of, of figure um so when cells do that um are they moving from side to side or do they all sort of like uh, cluster towards the start of the sine wave and then move along where the um, where where the wave goes. Like how how like do they, can they only move in lateral directions when they when they <clears throat> uh, exposed to the sound? Yeah, it's it's much easier I think to sort of um, uh, to draw this. Um, mm. But if you if you imagine a, a sine wave and you have this sort of peaks and troughs. Yeah. Um, so those are the the extremities. Um, cells, um, because of their their sort of two properties, their density and their compressibility, uh, they tend to cluster sort of in, in the middle. So in so not at the peak and not at the trough, but in the sort of uh, right in the very the very centre of uh, the right. node. Okay. Um, okay. Mm-hmm. And and yeah, you you do get um, you do get patterning sort of clustering towards these nodes. Does that make okay. sense. Yeah, yeah, no, no, thank you. Um, I think uh, that, yeah, the way in which I asked the question was maybe a bit, nah, nah, so, like, yeah, thank you. Um, okay, then, uh, you also use ultrasound. So what's the difference between sound and ultrasound? So I, um, as a sort of clarification, I only really use ultrasound. Uh, I talk ah. about this as sort of sound-based patterning, mm. um, but um, I only use ultrasound. And again, it comes back to um, that sort of wavelength. So... Uh, ultrasound is very high frequency uh, mm-hmm. sound, so above twenty kilohertz. Um, it's it's above the range that we can hear as humans, um, and uh, it has these wavelengths, which are sort of the appropriate size for for manipulating uh, patterning cells. Okay, cool. So then. Um ultrasound must have some sort of effect on um on on cells so does it um in, in addition to patterning so does ultrasound um uh, cause membrane disruption or does it kill cells does it make them unhappy in some kind of way so i think i get i think i get asked this question uh, at almost every time i give a talk and uh, it's a very very valid question because uh, i mean in many forms it, ultrasound is used to uh, disrupt membranes and disrupt cells mm. um, particularly if you're operating sort of just above that um, that sort of audible range so around sort of 20 uh, kilohertz or, or there or thereabouts um, uh, what I do is I, I, I work with much higher frequencies so between sort of 1 and 10 megahertz uh, and in this frequency range you, you don't see any of these permeabilization effects you don't see any disruption of, of the cell membranes Mm. Uh, and, and but we are very rigorous about this. We 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 expose ourselves to uh, these frequencies, and we look at them very carefully in terms of how uh, live they are, uh, whether they're still acting like the cell that they um, were before the exposure, um, and uh, we haven't found um, sort of any any differences there. And this is very consistent with what other people have shown. 
Um, but there, there is also some very interesting research. Uh, it's a mm -hmm. film called Low Intensity Pulsed Ultrasound, or LIPUS, uh, where people have shown that you can, you can um, use these ultrasound waves to promote a sort of beneficial effects in the cells, or you can push so maybe certain stem cell populations towards um, forming different types of cells. So uh, it's, yeah. it's a really big field. The, the, it's the, the mechanisms are still a little bit uncertain. Um, mm. A lot of people have shown that it's maybe beneficial for um, bone healing. So you have devices where um, you can um, uh, promote the formation of bone cells or promote the formation of, of mineralization. It's not a field which I'm um, particularly involved in, but I think mm. uh, you can potentially see some uh, beneficial effects with this. Um, as well as the maybe the negative effects that you see at the very very low frequencies. So that that's crazy because then I mean the obvious question to ask then is uh, and I know this might not be particularly your area but and it also might not be uh, figured out yet. But then do cells have some sort of receptor to sound? Like if you've got um, uh, like an oxygen sensor, do they have a receptor to sound or? Um, I don't think uh, per se. I mean, what you what you're creating here is um, pressure. Pressure. Sound. Mm. Sound is pressure. So, um, it's possible that sound waves might um, produce these pressure waves, which the cells can experience in terms of um, mechanical mm. transduction methods. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then I think um, some of the lipus uh, theories have involved um, calcium transport, uh, stimulating calcium transport across the membrane. Um, oh, okay. But again, right. it really isn't. It really isn't the sort of um, uh, the, the field of research which I'm sort of particularly specialised in. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. It's just, yeah, just very curious that you can just by like, yeah, um, you know, playing these cells a bass that they uh, they can differentiate. <laughs> no, it doesn't work like exactly like For that. sure. <laughs> um, okay, uh, so going back to ultrasound though, um, ultrasound is more commonly associated with things that people hear like um you know if you were to go for a pregnancy scan you'd have your ultrasound there or um sort of to break up kidney stones so when you go for these treatments should you be a little bit concerned that you know your other cells in you know uh, that are being disrupted in some kind of way you're trying to spark panic here amongst, <laughs> <laughs> amongst people. No, no, yeah. you should just, absolutely just not wondering. be concerned. Yeah. <laughs> if you're yeah. pregnant, you should definitely go for your uh, your, mm. uh, your pregnancy of scan. And if you have yeah, a kidney yeah. stone, please get it um, treated. Um, well, I, I think they're, they're two different ones. So uh, kidney stones, uh, uh, the, the, the treatment you use, there, I think, is very low frequency. So it's these sort of 20 kilohertz frequencies. Um, uh, and... Uh, these are used to sort of to, to break up the stones, um, and uh, the, the 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 pregnancy scans. These are these mm -hmm. are higher frequencies, more in the frequencies which which I'm using, um, uh, and these um, neither of these uh, are able to sort of rearrange your cells. Think, good, good. Yeah. Um, I, I, again, I think um, I'll stress that I, I spend quite a lot of time here building devices and optimizing them so that you're able to do this uh, and if if somebody was able to do it by accident it would be quite frustrating um, it, it's, it's all about control it's it's all, yeah. it's all about building building these fields which have this very very precise control uh, over the cells and, and you just don't get that from as you said your heart beating or your blood flowing or somebody scanning you with a with ultrasound for a, for a pregnancy scan. Oh, that's perfect. No, I was just after more reassurance, you know, from an expert that it's fine, you know. Um, so yeah, that's um, that's good. Definitely not trying to spark spark panic, but yeah, it's good to hear that it's definitely safe and you should go and uh, keep keep getting these scans and, and whatnot. But um, what else can we do with ultrasound other than patterning cells? Or using it for imaging. I mean, yeah, well, I mean, ultrasound, it's, um, it's fascinating. You can, um, um, it, it's, it's, it's used all across the, um, the biosciences and the physical mm. sciences here. You can um, use it to create very, very localized um, temperature raises. So you can produce really mm. astonishing high temperatures in a very small area for a very, a very short time. Uh, and this can be used to, um, to sort of trigger chemical reactions and things like this. Uh, and then um, there's a big field in, in using micro bubbles. So um, mm. the, these, uh, these are sort of bubbles which are responsive 
to uh, ultrasound fields. So um, you you actually use them uh, often in, in an ultrasound scan. So um, okay, they they're sort of they're, they're called a sort of contrast agents. Um, but you can also use them for drug delivery. So a lot of people have looked at uh, trying to deliver drugs um, on these uh, micro bubbles, which are injected into the body. And then you use an ultrasound field, which is uh, supplied from outside the body uh, mm -hmm. to sort of remotely burst these bubbles and release the drugs uh, sort of on demand and in a particular area of the body. Oh, so that's I think interesting. it's, it's okay. really fascinating. And then um, we, we've been using ultrasound, um, not just for patterning, but also uh, as a way of activating um, mm -hmm. um, molecules and molecular processes. So similar to the, the, the microbubbles, we, we can load up uh, these uh, sort of small carriers with, um, with cargoes, and then um, the, the, the ultrasound can burst these, and then we've used the cargo, which is released, to... Uh, activate enzymes so you can turn an enzyme on using ultrasound uh, and we've also used this to um, to form materials so you can um, wow. you can uh, you can turn uh, on the formation of a gel for example and, and and just linking this back to where this might be useful um, mm -hmm. because we can because we have all these ultrasound setups and we can uh, ultrasound can pass through the body it's a really exciting opportunity here yeah. to trigger the formation of a gel in the body um, and this can be used uh, for, for many different uh, sort of medical applications yeah that's that's genuinely awesome um, what's what's I suppose the most promising future medical application that you could use it for is this a sort of drug delivery maybe or there's there's drug delivery and there, there's also uh, well I mean I should say that a lot of people are using um, gels which um, sort of slowly set in the body so you inject them as a liquid and then they slowly set maybe this is due to your body temperature um, and people are looking at um, this for um, for example for um, spinal repair um, mm, and okay. uh, this is uh, we, we think we could do something quite similar but with um, a much more controlled sort of on-demand gelation Wow, that's really cool. And would this be using micro bubbles? Like, are these gels within micro bubbles, or is that different? So we can use micro bubbles. Um, yeah, so that that is one. Yeah. That is definitely one way of um, releasing the cargo to to turn on the the formation of the gel. Nice. And I suppose one final thing then, like, how do you make a micro bubble? Is it and what is it made of? Is it sort of like it's not like you know um, washing up liquid or something like that? But yeah, I, I mean, it essentially is. You just have um, <laughs> sort of you have, you have like lipids, yeah. um, which which are around the outside, and, and you pump it full of uh, air. Uh, and um, depending on the different um, sort of air that you use, you can um, have different levels of uh, sort of responsivity to the ultrasound field. Cool. Well, that's fascinating. That's such a really cool overview of sound. I never realized that it could be used in such creative and inventive ways. So, th yeah, thanks. I don't suppose you've got any final comments that you wanted to add in about, like, sound research before we move on? No, it's just uh, it's, it's, it's a fascinating area of research. And I think so many, people, so many people look at using light. Um, there's a, the light yeah. is a much bigger field for stimulating and triggering these processes and i think sound has just been quite undervalued and underappreciated um, but i think um, i think now people are starting to sort of appreciate it a little bit more so this next section is all about when you were young so um let's start with sort of your early years leading up to your undergraduate and what you studied so where did you grow up um, where are you from and then what did you study as an undergraduate? Yeah, I, I grew up in Bristol. Um, I, well, we, we didn't really move around very much uh, when I was a child. Um, so pretty um, stably in Bristol for 18 years and then I uh, decamped and I went to the University of Warwick uh, for okay. uh, my undergraduate and I, I studied chemistry. Mm. Um, okay. This was just something which I really enjoyed a school I had a I had a really inspiring teacher um, and um, yeah I, I, I loved the University of Warwick I loved the campus and uh, the the curriculum they offered so 
I was nice. pretty much not in doubt when I uh, when I was looking at choosing universities. But then you you were always sort of set on going straight for for chemistry um, because of an inspiring teacher. Did you ever consider sort of like other degrees, or it was always like, no, I'm going to go straight for straight for chemistry. Yeah, I mean, I, I also had a very very good biology teacher, um, and uh, it was a it was a toss up between those two subjects, um, and I I I liked the. Um, the sort of the the I liked the way that chemistry allows you to understand the world, and I, I found that at that time that was more interesting to me. I like to understand how things are built and uh, understand how processes happen. Uh, and I think subsequently I've I've moved more my research is more biological now, but I think mm. that chemistry has given me a really good grounding of of how things work and how things are put together. So what did you do when you were finishing your degree? What did you think about uh, career-wise? Did you think that you would potentially head into industry? Did you think you were going to go ahead and uh, study for a PhD straight away? Um, were you always clued in? Um, no. <laughs> I think, no, not, not at all. I, I've, I think um, it'll probably become quite clear I have, uh, I've had zero plan all along. <laughs> um, I think when I was um, doing chemistry, I love the subject. As I, said, I love the theoretical basis of chemistry, um, but I, I, I really, really did not enjoy the, the lab work. Uh, long, oh. long hours um, with That's solvents and it used to give me headaches and I just, mm. um, it, it it used to be quite demoralizing. You'd spend eight hours in, in an undergraduate lab and you'd produce a very, very tiny quantity of small white powder. Um, so it was, it was not really a, anything ever for me. And I swore that at this point I was never going to set foot in a lab again. Um, so I, I was looking for, I was looking for, for various jobs. And then um, sort of I just stumbled across the website of this um, doctoral training centre in Bristol, um, the uh, doctoral training centre called... Uh, um, uh, the, the Bristol Centre for Functional Nanomaterials. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just thought it sounded really interesting. I, I sort of uh, got that spark again. I, I, I um, didn't really understand too much about what a nanomaterial was at this point, but I did a mm -hmm. little bit of research and I applied and I was fortunate enough to get a position there. Uh, and that's just how I ended up doing a PhD at Bristol. <laughs> nice one. So you were back in your hometown. Uh, that must have had a, a sort of impact on your decision process. Yeah, I was I was uh, looking for jobs in Bristol uh, mm. at this point. Okay, cool. So then, um, uh, what what was your PhD uh, sort of about then? Like you mentioned briefly, nanomaterials. But what was your what was your thesis? Yeah. So the 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 the, the structure of the um, the doctoral training center was in nanomaterials. So. We had a lot of lectures in, in, in sort of um, um, physics and engineering and chemistry, uh, but then I ended up get sort of pivoting when I actually chose my final um, sort of lab placement. I, I sort of pivoted towards a project on stem cells, uh, and again, it, maybe it sounds like I'm just sort of chasing these buzzwords, but uh, <laughs> I, I, I thought this again. This just sounded like a fascinating field. What people were doing in um in bristol where they were building um sort of artificial car cartilage tissues uh and i just mm. wanted to be involved in this i found this uh concept a lot more interested than uh than the sort of sort of the, the theoretical um nanomaterial nanoscience um sort of uh work so um i, I did a phd in uh, engineering cartilage tissues nice one cool did you uh did you engineer any tissues then? How did it, how, how were you successful? How did it go? I did. Um, so, I mean, I would say the, the, the pro process for this, it's pretty established. So um, it, it's, if, if you have the right cells and if you have the right materials, it, it, it's actually quite easy to grow, grow cartilage. Um, but then there's um, some, some big problems here. So it, you can grow small pieces of tissue quite easily. But then as you get bigger and bigger and bigger, um, you start to have problems where you have this, the center of the tissue becomes quite, um, well, it's essentially dead. You don't get any of the nutrients or the growth factors mm. um, delivered into the center because you just have this um, sort of all, all the tissue around the outside. It's consuming all of the, these things like oxygen. Um, so I worked in a way of um, providing oxygen to the center of the tissue. 
um, to sort of try and grow these bigger tissue constructs which would be needed um, clinically. Wow, that's really cool. Um, yeah, it was really interesting. Uh, so what's the, I mean, maybe not for, for your project, but more for the field in general. Is it is it translatable at the moment? Are you able to sort of like uh, grow repair, grow a uh, tissue for, you know, uh, replacement or repair sort of on demand? Is that, um, is so it cartilage, that mature? Cartilage, yeah. t- cartilage tissue engineering is, is one of the few tissues which is sort of um, uh, making it to, to the clinic. Um, cartilage and um, skin uh, and um, mm. they're, they're the two sort of I mean I always get stick for saying but these are two of the simplest tissues um, <laughs> right. they, they, they perform um, a, a sort of role which you can replicate in the lab it's much harder to start growing brain tissue or, or mm. heart tissue or, or some of these more um, functionally complex uh, structures but cartilage it, it is definitely reached uh, the clinic. Wow, that's really, I, I had no idea actually. So that's yeah, that's really interesting to find out. Okay, so when you were sort of coming to the end of your PhD, because um, this this podcast is mostly for uh, the early career researchers out there who are thinking about the different um, potential career paths that they can go down. Um, it's it's interesting to find out what your uh, sort of decision processes were and also also just what you what you were thinking at the time really. So when you were coming to the end of your PhD, what did you sort of consider that you would want to do? Did you always know that you wanted to go down the academic track um, or did you consider other career paths? What was um what was going on? So I think I was always considering academia at this stage at, at, uh, I mean at the end of my PhD I sort of got through um, the rough part and sort of things were working uh, and I was starting to be sort of creative and I had all these ideas and these things that I wanted to explore um, and, I, and I think pretty much from then I was convinced that the job I wanted to do for the rest of my life was academia okay. um, and then it was just about how to achieve that so I mean I am um, I, I had a lot of supervisors in Bristol, actually actually five were on my supervision panel. Flipping um, that, department, I know, departments all across the university. Um, and uh, I spent a lot of time talking to them and the, the advice which I got from almost everybody was mm-hmm. you, need, you need to go abroad, you need to go to America, go work in a big lab um, mm. and get that experience, get that on your CV and you come back and you'll be like first in line for a lectureship uh, in the UK. Um, and I considered it. I was looking in labs. I, I contacted a few people. Mm-hmm. Um, but it didn't quite feel right for me at that time, like personal reasons and Fair um, enough. Sci- scientific reasons as well. So I, um, <laughs> but then I, I kept on having these people saying, no, you need to go to America. You need to go mm. to America. And then I, this just sort of made me a little bit more stubborn. And <laughs> I was like, no, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, I'm going to um, go to this lab in, in London, in, in, in the UK. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to do it and I'm going to get a job and I'm going I'm to show you. <laughs> so yeah. that was kind of my thought process. I mean, at the moment, I've, I'm sort of six years in and I haven't got a job yet. So maybe they were right. Um, but for me, I, I think if I was going to give a piece of advice to early career researchers, I think uh, you, you don't need to always listen to what people are telling you. People have a lot of really great advice. Um, but at the end of the day, it's, it's not just always... Um, about your career there's lots of other things you need to factor into that equation as well yeah certainly totally that's yeah that's really interesting to hear but then what what would your advice be uh i know you just said don't listen to people but um but (laughs) no you should listen to people you should listen to people certainly (laughs) you should you should and you yeah like you should always sort of it's it it's it's a balance, isn't it? You should always listen to what people have to say, but just because someone tells you something doesn't necessarily mean it's right for you or it works. But what would the sort of uh, like the golden advice be uh, that you, that you wish that you would have heard at that sort of critical juncture in your career? So I think it's good to have a plan uh, and to decide what is Im- important to you. Um, it. If, do you want to do you want to get that lectureship as soon as possible? Uh, is the career the sort of the overriding um, sort of factor in your head? And and then yeah, sure. I think in that case, going to the very best lab you can go to, um, going abroad. I think these things do give you an advantage. Um, but I think uh, it's also 
uh, as I said, there's other things to factor in here, and you need to um, you need to consider that there's lots of different ways to reach the same point. So some people take a break and they go to industry and then um, come back into academia. And, and I know several very successful academics who have taken that route. Mm. Um, or you can you can do two or three postdocs and you can still reach that final goal. Um, you don't need to go abroad. There's there's lots of different ways of um, of of making it in academia and there's not just sort of one route um so i think that's important and i don't think people sort of say that enough and i think that's important to get across yeah totally and then uh maybe just to close out this section then um would your advice for a postgraduate or a post phd position so a doctor um so a postdoc or a, a fellow such as yourself um what what sort of advice would you give to to these people who are sort of considering next career options is it similar advice or different um well i think uh, having gone having gone through the um the sort of um fellowship application route and the lectureship application route uh, qu quite a lot in in 2021 i think i've <laughs> i've spent most of my time um uh, this year doing that uh, I think um, it is important to consider all aspects of your CV. Mm, so I, okay. I've been very focused on publication and getting publications and patents out, um, giving uh, as many talks as I can, um, these sort of traditional metrics, let's say. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But there's, there's a lot of other things which people are looking for, these softer skills, um, these uh, sort of um, the, the training and the personal development that you've, you've gone through. Um, what's your contribution to uh, equality, diversity and inclusion? All of these things, um, you, you need to build up um, sort of quite a well-rounded CV so that um, when you're going into interview, you need to be able to um, demonstrate your um, sort of versatility. You're not just a scientist who can um, publish papers, but you're also going to contribute sort of broadly um, to the university or the, the institution. Yeah. For your next section, I want to talk all about your experiences in science. So let's just start off with what was your most memorable experience in science in general? Uh, yeah, so I mean, <laughs> so science is, um, I would say science is mostly not memorable. Um, I think any, anybody working here, and I'm sure you'll say the same. Um, <laughs> It's uh, you, you spend months and months and years sometimes of things not working. Um, mm. And um, these are maybe interspersed by like you have sort of um, a few hours or a day or a couple of days when it when it works. And yeah. those are really moments to treasure. Um, and I don't know how we all got conned into thinking that they, that makes all of that time which things didn't work worthwhile. Uh, I know um, we sold a dream somewhere along know, the line, aren't I we? I know. <laughs> it's, it's not the uh, it's not the sort of um, it, it's not the picture it's sometimes painted. No, it's not full of eureka moments. Eureka moments are sort of few and far between. Um, well, I think uh, and I think my first one actually. I think my first eureka moment was when I was doing my master's. Um, degree uh, mm -hmm. in, in, in my last my final final year labs I was trying to grow these crystals uh, on a slide I was following um, published protocols and things weren't working and um, in a very sort of master student way I was given sort of a whole bunch of very systematic uh, conditions to go through um, and uh, it wasn't working it wasn't working and then finally like right towards the end one of these conditions worked I looked down the microscope and I saw these crystals forming um, nice. And, and I knew that I would not have to go through uh, any more different combinations again. So that was one reason I was happy. But it's also just the feeling of like, yes, something's worked. I've, I've, I've gone through this systematically and I, I, I've, um, I, I've, I've managed to achieve what I was set out to achieve. Uh, and it was a very, very small win at that time, but it was my first win. And I think it was one of my most memorable. Yeah, fair enough. So then... Um, sort of uh, going from the highs, what was what was the biggest challenge? You know, what were the lows that you faced as a student? Well, um, I think um, in my PhD, um, I think everybody goes through sort of second year blues a little bit. 
um, again, you might you might be able to relate to this. Um, mm. Your first year, you're very you're very naive and you're learning things, and um, it's sort of okay. And then the second year, yeah. you sort of start to realise all the problems and the potential <laughs> issues, and you, you become smart enough to realise um, why your project might not work. Um, and I think the second year of PhD was was tough for me. Uh, I was trying a lot of different things, um, going through a lot of experiments which were not working, and uh, it, it's tough. You have to, you, you certainly need to develop a mental toughness in, in your second year of your PhD. And then fortunately for me, um, by the time I got to my third year, um, things sort of started to pick up again. And um, I, I think that's quite a sort of typical pattern of a PhD. Yeah, um, definitely. What was the best piece of advice that somebody ever gave to you? It doesn't necessarily need to be science-wise, but just something that has always kind of stuck with you uh, since, since you heard it. So I think it, um, it, I think I would give a science example. So um, sure. my PhD supervisor Adam Perryman, now a professor at Bristol, mm-hmm. um, was incredibly supportive and gave a lot of advice um, throughout my PhD. Um, and I think the one thing which really struck me and, and stuck with me is what he said to me just as I was leaving to go to Imperial, and it was basically just to think big um, and I think it's, it's quite a simple piece of advice but I think he was really getting at that if, if you're going into science um, occupy yourself with with big problems big challenges uh, things which are going to um, make an impact they're going to affect people yeah um, and, and not to get distracted by these sort of little side projects and um, Things which might seem academically interesting, but maybe are not going to have a, a purpose. So I, I think that was um, something which I'll, I'll, I'll definitely pass down to to future students as well. No, no, definitely. I, I sort of wish I'd have heard that a little earlier on in my PhD, to be honest, because I, I, I'm that person who I, I get an idea and I'm like, oh, that'd be really cool and I want to pursue it. It's a little side tangent to what I'm supposed to be doing. But yeah, it's, uh, it's certainly it's one of the... Mm. Yeah, it's a danger. I mean, that's it's a danger. You you working. You, you're a creative person if you're a scientist, and you're working yeah. with a bunch of creative people. And there's going to be ideas. It's really <laughs> tough to 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 shelve them or save them or ignore them. Definitely. So, what has been the uh, the highlight of your career so far? I think. Um, well, I, I think I've really really enjoyed supervising students at Imperial. So I'm an assistant supervisor, mm-hmm. um, which is quite a nice position to be in. So, uh, so um, I don't actually um, uh, fund the students, but I, I, I supervise, um, mm-hmm. co-supervise them. Um, and um, it's just been a real joy, like taking on the students at the beginning. They're, they're, they're sort of very, very smart people, but they they, they don't know how to do science. They, they haven't had that long exposure which the PhD gives you. And then just teaching them and um, helping them and to develop and um, yeah. showing them how to, 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 to design an experiment, how to, um, how to carry it through, how to troubleshoot, how to analyze the data, and uh, all the way through to, to publication and graduation from your PhD. It's uh, the, 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 the moments that my students have graduated and passed, mm-hmm. or not, not graduated, but the moments that they've um, passed their viva and they come out there. I think those are my big highlights I think I've had in, in my career so far. Yeah, good. I mean, that certainly bodes well for future, obviously, because, um, you know, if you want to stay in academia, you, there's, you, you need to supervise a lot more students. But yeah. but, but also that um, you, you're also being a, a little bit modest here because um, uh, James actually won an award for, uh, for, for from the president of the Imperial, I think it was, um, for being an outstanding uh, supervisor. So you know, it's not just that you you're doing this job of supervising people; you're also being recognised for that externally. So you know, you're doing an incredibly good job of it. And I, mm, thank yeah. you. Oh, no, thank you. I mean, I mean um, yeah, I I, I I was delighted to win that. My students actually uh, banded together and, and nominated for me that me for that, which I think um, was 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 really uh, touching. And I think I, I see so many good examples of um, um, people supervising um, at Imperial. Um, yeah. And 
I, I was just yeah, I was delighted to win that award. But I, I think uh, that, that other there's lots and lots of other people at Imperial who are putting um, the same, if not more, dedication to their students. Um, and for yeah. me, it, it's all about it's it's scientific support. So it's all those things I mentioned, um, mm-hmm. data yeah. analysis and um, reviewing output and things like that. But then there's there's this whole other level of pastoral support. So it's yeah. making sure that the mental health and well being side of things is. Uh, supported and that you're there as a as a uh, not just a supervisor but also as a, as a friend to um, uh, support students if they're if they're encountering difficulties yeah definitely it's something that is it's obviously a lot more uh, topical now mental health but it was um yeah and and, and it's, it's rightly so that there's more emphasis placed upon it so it's yeah it's, it's really good to see that there's you know people coming through the ranks such as yourself who are you know outstanding in this uh in this capacity well, I, I had i had no idea during my phd um mm. that there was sort of support services available and i think uh, at imperial there's some fantastic there will be at bristol as well but at imperial yeah there's great professional support uh, and that's i mean you can provide a, a pastoral role yourself um but one of the main things you need to be doing as a supervisor is um acting as a conduit between your student and the, the professional services so making sure the student knows what services are available to go to them if they're encountering certain problems and yeah. um uh, and, it, and the, as you said it's just it's it's um really coming to the forefront now and there is so much more support and so much more um sort of um understanding of some of these issues yeah so going from highlights of your career and you, you are only an early career researcher still, so um, this this might not apply just yet, but what was the hardest decision that you've had to face in your career so far? Uh, I mean, <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't know if this is an, as an answer, but I think I, I, I wouldn't say I've, um, I've faced too many hard decisions. I think yeah, sure, sure, sure. Uh, we talked about the sort of... Um, We've talked about the career decisions I've made, going to Warwick, going to Bristol, going to London. For me, these these were all quite straightforward decisions. Um, there was a little bit of thinking involved, and um, but I, I don't, I'm incredibly indecisive when it comes to picking a film on Netflix or <laughs> choosing choosing uh, sort of what food to eat on a menu. But um, yeah. when it comes to when it comes to um, my career decisions and um, how to um, progress I, I just I've always gone with just what f- feels right and that's sort of guided me and, and made the decisions quite straightforward for me fair enough yeah it's, it's good to do that to not overcomplicate it as well um, it makes your life a whole lot easier <laughs> yeah, you, yeah. Um, are you a working parent yeah I am I, I have a three-year-old boy and a, and a oh. one-year-old girl um so what's your yeah. experience yeah that, so congratulations so they're uh, quite young um but what what has your experience been of being a working parent in science have you found it easy to work or uh, like has it has it been flexible um just just in general how have you how have you how have you uh, found things yeah well it's 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 different for sure <laughs> um, i think uh i mean when my son was born um i was under quite a lot of pressure to mm-hmm. to publish i had been uh, i'd been working at imperial for three years and um no sort of research papers out at this stage um and um yeah there was it was definitely a balancing act i remember during paternity leave i was um, I had my son on one knee and my laptop finishing off a manuscript in, 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 on, on my other knee. Um, and um, I, you, 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 you do, it, it can be a struggle. It, it yeah. can be a struggle, uh, certainly, because as scientists, you're so used to sort of working around the clock and you need mm-hmm. to make adjustments. And I think certainly by the time my daughter's arrived um, last year, uh, I, I've, I've, I've understood that a lot more now. Uh, and I've adjusted my uh, working patterns a lot better. Yeah, um, I was I was going to ask about boundaries. Are you more sort of um, I don't know the word maybe strict with your boundaries uh, in terms of yeah. like your work life balance than than you perhaps used to be? Yeah, I'm. I'm. I, and and I think you become a lot more efficient as well. So you have to cut. Something, <laughs> you, you have yeah. to cut something out. Um, and uh, I I now I. It, 
where I possibly can, I try and take my kids to uh, nursery and, and, and pick them up. So those are sort of my um, boundaries for my, for my day. Mm-hmm. And then when I'm working, I, I am just working solidly. I try not to distract myself uh, in the way that I might have done before kids. And but pre-kids, there's a lot of sort of spontaneous coffee breaks and uh, a lot of time when you're just <laughs> yeah. browsing the internet and things like this. And you can afford to just um, to, to just work late into the evening. Um, but with kids, you need to sort of um, rejig your priorities. Yeah, I can imagine. So I, I, I don't have kids just yet, but it's um, it's always interesting to hear these um, the, uh, people's stories about how, how they've sort of fared in, in academia. Um, I suppose, do, do you... Uh, then like are you more flexible with your lab hours as well as sort of like the the more sort of te- um, administrative or technical like writing um so do you do you are you more strict with lab time how does how does that work yeah so as well as um sorry as well as my job and having kids i also do a very long commute <laughs> from swindon to london um which eats oh, wow. a, a lot of know. time okay. so yeah. so juggling those three things has been um has been quite something um flipping that's a really I, long way <laughs> it is it is but i think um i think i think now uh, i've definitely reached a stage now where um the, the pressure to publish is easing somewhat uh, and my life my working life is is more paperwork and uh shifted out of the lab somewhat so now i um i, I go into work two or three days a week and and this this gives me two days where i can be working from home and I can be um, sort of on hand if, if, if I'm needed to, to, to look after the kids, which I think is, is a major advantage of, of science. No, you, you, you don't get that so much with other jobs, maybe mm. a bit more in the pandemic now. Um, yeah. But science, you've always had this, this opportunity and this flexibility to work from home or dictate your working hours a lot more. So just to round off this section, uh, what would your top work-life balance advice be? I think to make sure that you, you have a work-life balance. I think uh, science is so, <laughs> yeah. so, so all-consuming. Um, you, you are, I mean, I, I, well, I, I'm sure it's not just me, but you are, you are thinking about science and your work and your projects almost 24-7. Um, mm. And even if you're not in the lab or you're not working on a paper, you're, you're thinking about it. So you need well, to you need to have really protected time off and and um, I I'm quite strict I'm, I'm definitely very strict now on uh, protecting my weekends and um, protecting uh, my evenings where possible um, and then making sure you you do activities which make you able to uh, sort of forget science for for a few hours and and i think uh, otherwise you just you you I've, I've seen it so often you just end up with burnout and that's yeah. just not helpful for anybody involved so so at weekends just as an example do you just have a mental switch where you just kind of like you just not thinking about stuff well i i try i try to very much um not do major pieces of work on the weekend i think um I mean, I, I don't. I wouldn't say you have to, but I, I do um, attend to my emails on the weekend, and um, uh, I, I'll only answer emails. I think if, if it's if it's important, if it can wait till Monday, well, that's a pretty cool. hard and fast rule. I'll just wait until Monday, and that sort of stops my um, stops me stops me processing and stops me um, sort of engaging in science when I should be focusing on my kids and. Um, focusing on family or, or friends or whatever uh, other things I might be doing on the weekend. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, well, thank you very much. That was, that was great. So this next section is about uh, your passions outside of science. So um, you mentioned you've already, uh, you, you've now got kids, but uh, what, what do you like to do in your leisure time? So I, I love to play football. Um, I, it's a bit of a boring answer, but um, I, <laughs> I've played football since I was uh, a very small child, and um, and uh, I I just love the I, I think we were just talking about this in the last section, but I just yeah. love the fact that it can help you switch off. Yeah. So my mind is buzzing on science all the time, um, but in that sort of hour where I'm playing football, I just 
um, I'm only thinking about winning the ball or yeah. um, scoring a goal or, or, or winning the game. And, and it's, uh, it's a real sort of uh, meditative almost experience that uh, <laughs> I can properly switch off. And, I, and, I, and uh, there's, there's very few things which, uh, which, which help me relax in that way. So that's actually a really interesting answer. I didn't know this about you because I'm I'm very very similar. Like I, I feel like I'm always thinking about things all the time. But then you know, in that hour once a week, when the ball is at my feet, I think about absolutely nothing else apart from yeah, the the real sort of competitive streak comes out in me, and I'm like, no, like we need to win this game, which means absolutely nothing in the grand scale of things, but it's just know. That, you know, <laughs> people, like... people do say I change from this very sort of, uh, <laughs> this very sort of sedate, calm scientist into uh, a bit of an animal on, on the football pitch. <laughs> um, cool. Uh, so, do, do, I mean, yeah, what, are you trying to sort of get your kids involved in science as well? Like, um, what, what else do you, do you take them to uh, museums and such or... Are you just sort of like trying to get their creative, um, you know, uh, flares to show naturally, or you're trying to push them down a scientific route? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I say we haven't really taken them anywhere in the last year for obvious reasons. Oh, of course, um, but, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I, how, I think how can I, was... I forget that? <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah. also, I think, um, I think uh, they're, they're they're still quite young, and we've yeah. never been. Well, I I'm very sort of keen not to push them down any particular path. Fair enough. Uh, good whether, for you. Whether that's yeah. whether that's football or whether that's science or um, we we if if they show an interest in something we'll reciprocate that interest. Um, but I was never pushed into science or into football, and uh, these are the two things which I um, mm. in, enjoy most in life. And um, and I I think that's because there was never this pressure or this sort of yeah. tiger moms or this sort of this sort of. Um, um, this sort of ex- external influence on, on on me and what I what I should do or um, should be spending my time doing. Yeah, fair enough. But then I suppose you are. Uh, it's similar for me, but um, again, like it's it's more uh, what your influences are. So if if you if they if you could see that 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 dad being in you know sort of like in, so interested in science or watching the science program, I suppose you just sort of pick it up by association, I guess. So yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I mean, we we have. We we're well placed to have conversations. We we talk about space and rocket ships and dinosaurs, like all those sort of kid <laughs> things. Yeah, and uh, and and we we try and give like proper scientific answers, not sort of child answers. So we try and um, we try nice. and sort of explain things in a, in a in a scientific way, which is appropriate for their age. Um, <laughs> and 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 and, and uh, you can see it's really sparking. Um, well, mm. our son, the three year old, we can see it's really sparking his his curiosity. Yeah, cool. So then, um, what are you a passionate advocate for? Well, I think we touched on this a little bit before, but it's, it's mm-hmm. mental health and well-being. It's um, yeah. I, I I've seen so many bad examples um, in the several places which I've worked in, um, where people uh, are really struggling. Science is, um, as I said, is all consuming, and you have this pressure to publish. You have this very competitive. Um, environment yeah and um, and then <laughs> as I said if your experiments aren't working for uh, six months or a year uh, yeah. it can really get to you um, and uh, yeah just make as I said just making sure that I, I, I'm there for um, to support my students or, or if I see somebody else in in a meeting or in the lab who are, look like they might be struggling being mm-hmm. there for them um, and, and and I think uh, as you said earlier, I think it's really um, it, it's getting better, but I think there's a lot, a, a long, long way before we we change the uh, the whole sort of the the scientific system to more focus on on the person and the the sort of pastoral needs of the people, rather than on this uh, publish publish nature science like uh, that. There's too much emphasis on the latter at the moment. So I'd like to get some final thoughts from you now. And um, how do you see the future of uh, the bioacoustic research that you are uh, that you're conducting? Well, I think the um, the future is really bright. Um, we've um, made tremendous progress in the last few years. So we, we've we've moved from being able to pattern cells. We can now uh, trap those cells in biomaterials, and we can grow tissues from them. Um, 
so the the next step now is is how far can we take this? Can we mm. um, create more more customized patterns? And there's been some fascinating work with holograms, um, being able to get away from sort of simple lines and moving it more towards uh, any kind of pattern that you wish. So there's real possibilities here of, of using this as a method of growing blood vessels, uh, and sort of complex oh, wow, architecture cool. blood vessels. Mm. But then that that comes onto another challenge. It's um, people are starting to do this, um, myself and other people in the field, is moving from this 2D patterning into 3D. So yeah. most, most, most tissues are 3D. Yeah. Um, so um, being able to pattern tissues in 3D and being able to pattern the cells in, in any kind of organization you want. Um, and uh, again, something which you alluded to with a great question in the first section was um, being able to have... Um, maybe more complex fields which can stimulate um, different parts of the cells or different, uh, sorry, different cells or different parts mm. of the tissue in, in different ways. So you're not just organizing the cells, but maybe you're also organizing um, different cell populations in different ways, or you're organizing um, the cells in one way and the material in another yeah, way. I think there's, exactly. there's some, uh, it, it's, it's, it's going to be really technically, technically challenging, but I think uh, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of scope for using this as a tool to build some really complex structures. So what's the advantage of using a, a sound hologram versus using a, a light hologram? Yeah, okay, so um, it, it comes down to wavelength uh, and it comes down to the sort of size of the things you can manipulate. So we talked okay. again in the first session, in the first section about how um, acoustics and ultrasound, they're very well placed for manipulating sort of micron, micrometer uh, sized objects, uh, whereas light is very good for manipulating uh, sort of nanoscale matter. So okay. there's been some fascinating work in, in holographic uh, optical tweezers, um, picking up objects and, and moving them around, um, manipulating these sort of these, these nanoparticles and, and nanoscale systems. Hmm. Yeah, that's really cool. Okay. Um, so I mean, you're obviously a, sub, a, a huge subject matter expert, but taking a step back, I'd, I wonder in science in general, which emerging trend do you see as having the greatest potential? Well, I don't think, I, I wouldn't want to necessarily pinpoint one particular trend. I, I think sure. it's, it's, it's just a really interesting time to be in science. In the biosciences, I think we have these things, these gene editing technologies where you can very controllably change the, 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 the genome of cells. Um, and then we have uh, this sort of reprogramming, you can reprogram cells into stem cells. Uh, and then all these different assembly techniques, so you can use printing, and um, I know um, some of the research you're doing in the sort of uh, organ on a chip and yep. organoids. Um, we have basically, we're, we're reaching a point now where we have such a, a mastery over cells and how to control them and how to grow different um, structures and I think it's a combination of all of these which is really going to lead to advances in, um, in tissue graphs and uh, sort of um, uh, and understanding diseases and, and development. Uh, we, we now have all the tools in place I think to do some really exciting research. Yeah I, I totally agree you know <laughs> yeah all of these different um, tools that we're that we're now using they're all I mean, uh, the thing is that there's there's so many issues, there's so many um, mechanisms that are not well understood, and each tool provides a different insight. So I don't think anyone's going to be short of anything to do anytime soon. I think we've got uh, we've got plenty to be doing. So if there is anyone out there uh, who's a bit you know stuck about where where they want to go next, you know, get get yourself into science. <laughs> you yeah, know, it's, and it, it's the confluence of these techniques. I mean. Um... We, we talked about um, organoids growing these, these, these very complicated biological structures. And, and that's one thing. But then if you don't have the, the sort of gene editing tools to be able to, um, to, be able to um, study individual genes mm. uh, and their effect on the, uh, the organoid, then, um, then, then you, you don't have this ability, this, this control to be able to understand the system as well. So it's, it's, it's all about the basic biological tools and then I think these these really high-end assembly approaches yeah so the very final question in which I ask all my guests um, if you could do it all over again what would you keep the same and what would you change 
good question. I would uh, <laughs> I, I would probably have more of a plan to be honest. Uh, <laughs> I think, um, but having said that, I wouldn't change anything that I that I've done. I I think I sort of I, I stumbled into a PhD. Um, I, I didn't have a sort of um, clear plan about how I wanted to achieve where I am now. Mm-hmm. But I think uh, I just followed my heart and my. Um, uh, I, I, I think in doing that, I've um, I've been very happy in all those different career stages, and um, it, it it has worked. Uh, at least it, w- it will work when I uh, hopefully one day get a job. I am <laughs> so confident you will. You're an incredible early career researcher. The research you're doing is, is honestly is fascinating. I'm really interested to see the future of these the the holograms and the uh, you know the, the completely sort of like customized patterns. It's it's completely fascinating. Um, thank you very very much for giving up your time to speak to me today uh, to feature on this podcast. Uh, really appreciate it. Thanks, James. No, no problem, and it's it's a real pleasure to be involved. I've listened to the other. Um, other other episodes in your series and uh, it's a real pleasure to be uh, on today thank you there is so much untapped potential for using ultrasound in biological research i'm really excited to see how the field is going to evolve i want to thank james again for such a brilliant episode and for giving up his time to be a guest the next episode is going to be released on the 14th of july and will feature professor justin mason of imperial college london where we're going to talk all about cardiovascular diseases including rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. Justin also shares his career path and some incredible advice for early career researchers. It's definitely not to be missed. Please make sure that you can keep subscribing and following us on our Twitter and YouTube platforms and also please rate us on your podcast platform because this helps us out a huge deal with the metrics and will be very very much appreciated. Thank you very much for listening. Until next time!